Hello, hello, welcome everyone. Hi, Jared. Give everyone a second to hop on and connect. You wanna turn your cameras on, show us your smiling face. That's always more fun. Hello, Donna, it's good to see you again. Good to see you too, Paul. So while everyone's hopping on and getting signed in, um, if you wanna pop into the chat, introduce yourself, say when you graduated from Florida Tech, where you're living now, what you're doing now, anything that your heart desires, go ahead. The chat is yours to use for the whole event if you have any questions. And while you're doing that, I'll introduce myself. My name is Jillian LeClaire and I work in the Alumni Center here in Melbourne, Florida. And I'm so excited to be hosting this event today in partnership with your fellow alum, Paul Sekala. Um, and did I say that right, Paul? Sekala? Sekala, but that's Sekala. okay. I answer to anything almost. Sekala, okay. Um, and he just put um, a link to his LinkedIn in the chat. Thank you so much. Hi, Ed from Canada. Thank you for joining us. David Belinsky, class of 1991, ocean engineering, living in New Jersey. Fellow New Jersey and Paul. Yeah, we're in Jersey. Uh, uh, Dave, sorry. We're in Jersey, David. Uh, Southern New Jersey, outside of Philadelphia. Ah, I'm up in Morris County in Northern Jersey. Two different states. <laughs> Pretty much, right? <laughs> Just ask any New Jersey and they'll tell you that. Exactly. <laughs> We have Larry in Springfield, Virginia, hoping to retire to Melbourne. Donna Casario, Jared, class of 2018, retiring from the Navy. Thank you so much for your, oh, sorry, retiring from the Army. Um, thank you for your service. Laura, hello. All right, awesome. Continue to introduce yourself if you'd like, but I'm gonna hop in and introduce our featured speaker today, Paul. Paul Sakala um, is class of 1985. He is a certified global career development facilitator, work search author, and founder of Sakala Career Consultants. Since 1999, he has assisted over 3,000 job seekers ranging from C-suite executives to college students. Paul specializes in creating job search project plans, networking skills, interview techniques, and resume writing. He has assisted people from a variety of backgrounds with expertise in diversity, equity, and inclusion, aviation, business leadership, project management, technology, pharma, biotech, and healthcare. Paul has helmed the adult professional education programs for Fairleigh Dickinson University, the County College of Morris, and government workforce development at a one-stop career center. Prior to career coaching, Paul spent 15 years in corporate aviation working for Flight Safety International, KC Aviation, Jet Aviation, and ending as Vice President of Aircraft Charter Sales for Atlantic Aviation. Paul has a Bachelor of Science in Psychology from Florida Institute of Technology, of course. Paul spent nine years as a member of the Florida Tech Alumni Association, including two years as president in the 1990s, and currently sits on the Industry Advisory Board for the College of Psychology and Liberal Arts here at Florida Tech. He lives in Morris County, New Jersey, as he mentioned, with his husband and teenage son. And I want to thank Paul for volunteering your time today to give this lecture for your fellow alumni. And with that, I will turn it over to you. Great, thanks. And as we go through the, the presentation, if you all just raise your hand when you have something to say, then um, we'll make sure to, to get to hear what you have because I would like this to be as interactive as possible. Um, we have a little bit of a time constraint, but that's not gonna be a problem for us. Um, and so we're gonna talk about what the heck is going on in the employment world today? As many of us know, it's just constantly changing. And how do we keep up with that? And what do we have to do to keep employed and to move our career forward? So we're gonna look at those topics as we go through the presentation. And again, please chime in with your questions and your comments. To start that off, I'd like to hear, what do you see as some of the current trends taking place in the current employment market? And you can raise your hand to, to answer, or if you wanna just throw it into the chat, that would be okay as well. Go ahead, Jared. So um, it's kind of unique for me because I'm coming out of the army 
out of like a cult to the actual workforce. But yeah. from what I'm seeing is that um, if you, I've been on LinkedIn. So the main thing is for me with engaging with everyone else, engaging with the recruiter, engaging with the hiring manager, or engaging with people that actually work in the actual industry to figure out what I want to do or where I want to go. So that's some of the trends as far as I'm talking for military folks going out. So that, that gives you a unique perspective because some of you are already been out in the workforce, but you have a whole group, a whole breadth of people that are in the military that are trying to go into the workforce. Beautiful. Perfect. Thanks. Anybody else? Any thoughts? Don't be shy now. Well, here's some of the things that, that I'm seeing and some of the observations that I've made um, in general. You know, the, the great resignation is a real thing. Uh, it's more than that, though. A lot of people are calling it the, the great shuffle, the great renegotiation, the great resurgence. Um, I just saw on a local news station this morning that a, a nationwide study was done and uh, and I forget the name of the group that did the study, but they had reached out to 5,000 people who had recently changed jobs as a part of the Great Resignation and found that 50% of them were not happy with the change they made and looking to either return back to their other employment or looking for something new already. And I think that's not a surprise to me as a career coach because so many of us jump at things without really knowing what we're jumping into. And so how can we do a better job of making sure that when we're ready to make a change, the change we make is the appropriate one for us? Um, so yes, Beth, a, a lot of people are changing their jobs, not just in tech, but in a lot of different industries, right? Um, I think we're gonna see uh, a lot more in the way of disruptors um, and, and what are they going to look like? Oops, sorry, I'm playing games with my screen here and it's not, there we go. Um, there are going to be more and more disruptors coming. And one of the things that we're going to need to be doing as people in the workforce is a better job of predicting or looking for what is the next disruptor and how are we going to manage that? And we need to think about not just things like the pandemic, which my God has been a crazy disruptor, but think about, for example, how has Amazon disrupted the whole supply chain and logistics industry, right? How has technology changed the way we do business on a daily basis and is changing the way we do business every single day? Work from home is a disruptor in and of itself. And how are we managing that, right? So flexible staffing options is going to be a, a, a huge issue going forward. It's already an issue. Diversity, equity, and inclusion, I think are sometimes overused in industry right now, but absolutely when you look at Gen, Z, Gen Zoomers, there's for the Gen Zs, they're Gen Zoomers these days, um, they're really keen on wanting to know what a company is doing around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And if you're not walking the walk, they don't want to work for you. So how do we manage that both as, you know, the tail end baby boomer that I am, right? How do we manage that in, in the way we run our businesses? How are they managing it? And how's everybody in between looking at it in the way they approach business, right? So that's becoming a really, really hot topic these days. Um, we've certainly seen what's happened with supply chain and how do we have to re-examine the way we look at supply chain. I've heard of many companies actually looking to bring back on shore their manufacturing processes so that they can have a greater control over the supply chain. Inflation and recessions, all of these things are significantly impacting the way we do work and the way we look for work. Any of those items resonate with anyone? You wanna share a topic or a comment? Uh, maybe about the flexible staffing. 
uh, in my industry, I work for information technologies, and in my in industry, I'm seeing a lot of hiring from especially India. Uh, my company specifically does it a lot, and I think that it's going to be an issue in the future in United States uh, employment. Absolutely, and uh, you know, flexible staffing and hybrid work also talks of, or looks at you know. What is a typical workday going to be in the future? Is a nine to five, or more realistically, eight to six, really the right times for us to work? I know so many people who, because of our multinational and, and international companies doing business around the world, they're having meetings at four, five, six a.m. in order to be with the folks in India. And then again at 8, 9, 10 p.m. in order to be with the uh, folks in China and Japan, right? And so what do we do? Are we gonna work a 12 or a 14 hour business day? Or do we take time off in the middle and have those morning meetings, take time off and then have those evening meetings? And how does that impact our family life and our work-life balance? So all of these things are impacting on uh, the way we do work. That's a great comment. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, so uh, come on, there we go. Some things that I, I've been observing that employees are looking for. And employers are kind of good with the gig economy too, by the way, not just employees. But the gig economy is not only here to stay, it is probably the future of work if you talk to a most futurists. Uh, employers look at that as a way of being more flexible in their staffing. Employees look at it as a way of being more nimble and getting more experience and climbing the ladder, especially again, the Gen uh, Ys and Gen Zs are looking at job hopping as the way to climb the ladder. Okay, so we've seen it too in, in my generation where if you're not bringing current related skills that are needed for the project at hand, you're out the door and the new guy is in that does have the skills, right? So we need to be prepared for that kind of work environment going forward. Um, a lot of my clients in their 50s and older are like, I'm looking for a job that's gonna last the rest of my career. They don't exist anymore. There are a few fields where that may be true, like teaching you know, or anything that's unionized, you may be able to get away with a longer term position. But Kelly Staffing recently did a study that showed the current job lasts 18 to 30 months and the current career lasts 10 years. So we all have to become experts at job search at some point sooner than later. Um, the four day work week really neat. I think this is game changer. Americans are not used to doing four day work weeks. Now, Jared, that's a great point, but there's a lot to think about when you talk about a four day work week too. For example, is your entire company on the same four day week? Or is the company staggering that work week among the employees so that they are still open for five or more business days? And if that work week is staggered among the employees and my day off happens to be Thursday, just as an example, do I still have to be available to you as an employer for questions and meetings that come up on Thursday, which is technically one of my days off. So people who have been working in the four day work week have found it's not necessarily all it's cracked up to be. And that sometimes the five day week with greater flexibility to choose the hours in which I work has been a, a better option. But both of these are becoming popular more and more in the United States. Great comment. Anybody else have any comments on the things you see here? I'll just 
comment on, on number six, the work search versus job search. That's kind of a pet peeve of mine, and it goes back to the idea of the gig economy. You know, we're used to seeking jobs and looking for jobs in the United States. But I think we need to change our perspective and look more for work. And work could be a temporary assignment. It could be uh, you know, your own company or employment. It could be a W-2 employment. It could be you know, day trading on the stock market. But all of these are options for ways that we create work that creates and generates income for us. And that's some of the things I think we need to be considering. David, what are your thoughts? I was just going to add the uh, sense of meaning. Um, I definitely see and I feel a sense of uh, being able to give back to the community and, um, you know, just societal um, giving in terms of the companies that you work for. My company in particular does a lot of uh, community service, a lot of things that are around the water industry. Um, and that's hugely fulfilling. It's a, a great addition. And it's also something that we're seeing as people are coming into the workforce, more and more are attracted to that kind of aspect of the, the job. And, you know, it's interesting too, when you look at it from the different age groups, Mm -hmm. uh, and again, I'm, I'm oftentimes doing the disparity between the youngest and the oldest generations in the workforce today. But um, <clears throat> the, the older generations, say 40 and older, when they talk about meaningful work and value, that, or work that brings value to society, they're really talking more about what's the impact of my job on society. What's the impact of my job on the quality of the program of the work that I do on on the success of the company, whereas the Gen Z's and sometimes Gen Y's, they're actually looking more at environmental sustainability, uh, social justice, and those issues, and how is my role, my work contributing positively to the environment, to climate change, to social justice. So same idea, but two different, very different ways of looking at them, right? Um, thanks, Jillian, I'm glad you agree. <laughs> Good comments though. Anybody else, any other comments? Thanks. Uh, Kristen had said in the chat, um, she feels there's a disparity in flexible work for those who have to be on site, like healthcare and manufacturing, compared to maybe office professionals within the same company. And you know, that's another place where CEOs um, and the C suite in general are really struggling with how do we balance the different needs of the different types of employees as well as the different ages of employees and what they want out of work. I know several manufacturing companies where the CEO has basically said, since I need that machine operator in the building every day, and we're running three shifts a day to crank out our product, it's not fair for me to allow our business office people, our white collar folks to work from home. So I want everyone in the office. Right. Others are looking at it differently. And, and now it's going to be another issue that both human capital specialists need to consider and, and managers need to consider. So it's, it's all unknown, too. Uh, you know, so much of this is changing so fast. People are having trouble keeping up with it and employers are having trouble figuring out what's the right option for them. Jillian Ward, go ahead with your comments. Yeah, just a, continuing that, um, you know, I, I, I sort of understand the CEO saying, hey, manufacturing plant, you have to be here. My office staff, you also have to be here. But then you're taking, you know, someone who um, went to college, got a degree um, to have a more flexible schedule and almost punishing them 
because of other people. And, and I can say this from experience, my, my husband, he is having to go into the office every single day because his coworkers aren't as efficient at home as he is. And they're all able to work from home. And he flat out told his boss, I do the same amount of work as they do in 30 hours, but it takes them 60. And I'm coming to the hour office and having a two hour commute. Yes, where I live is my choice, but a two hour commute. And I'm a parent, new parent, and lost that flexibility. And it's almost like you're punishing somebody for someone else's choices or lack of efficiency. And, you know, and that's the other side of it. That's the way. I know I'm considered a millennial, but um, I'm on the <laughs> older age of millennials. And um, I don't feel like that age group is going to go for that. And I know my husband is just, he's waiting to see how this plays out. And mm -hmm. he doesn't know how long he's going to stick. He likes it, but he doesn't like that he's being punished for other people's and inefficiency. And, and that's a matter of perspective too, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I sometimes wonder too, and this is going to be a, a an inflammatory comment, I suspect, but I sometimes wonder if in the United States, especially, we appropriately value the work that people do um, and, and whether or not, you know, I mean, skilled labor is still skilled, mm -hmm. right? It okay. may not be white collar, but it's definitely skilled and therefore has a value that is certainly equal to, in most cases, most white collar or college educated labor. But, but every company is going to have to take a look at that and how are they going to manage that within their own workforce. Mm -hmm. and, and my point here is that, you know, upper level management has not yet recognized in many cases that that's something that's important for them to address and truthfully address sooner than later mm -hmm. equally and this is again kind of moving on to a different topic and i'll get to you in just a second jared um the we management has not yet learned how to manage a remote workforce or a hybrid workforce mm -hmm. and that has to happen before people of my generation are going to feel more comfortable with letting you work from home and be productive at home and changing our perspective of how do we evaluate work from time-based to accomplishment-based or, or uh, performance-based work. And that's another change that's still taking place. So there's a lot of change happening and how we manage it is, is the big issue. Go ahead, Jared. Yeah, that's interesting um, how Juliana was talking about that, because like you got to look at it from from uh, from our perspective for the crossover parts portion of it. When COVID happened, we we normally function off of being there, being presence was everything. But then we had to go to to to, to at first a total remote thing. That goes from it so it was a lot of changes but what it happened was it exposed what people were really doing so the people that were just doing presence and not doing anything it, yeah. it, it, it created a whole bunch of us that actually were doing it and producing it, and we got even more effective because we knew how to leverage the tech the technology that we have so um i wanted to, to do that and also i wanted to point out also like a lot of us coming out we have a lot of soft skills that actually um, work towards our hard skills because what we're finding is that we have the leadership because we were forced to do a leadership that yeah. wasn't out there in the workforce. So I'm used to getting treated like crap. So if I'm already used to getting treated <laughs> like crap, I don't care, but I didn't have a choice. But now that I go out, you know, I can, I can do out there. I know how it is to get treated like crap. So I'm not going to treat my employees. And I also made it that like, why, like right where I'm working at right now, I told my guys right now, hey, I don't care if I see you one hour, two hours in a day, long as I make a phone call and I need information, you give it to me and long as it's production. And I found out that worked perfect with it. So it's like it's a balance. It's a balance of what you can do, what you can't do and what us as leaders can do to help the uh, to help our subordinates below us. Good points, Jared. Great, great points. And and that's, you know, some of the space where employers are trying or struggling. Right. And, and as employees, how do we help 
our management structure to figure out the best way to handle those struggles within our own organization. Pardon me, my chair is sliding down. There we go. Um, so, so now let's look at this a little bit more from the employer's perspective and, and this whole concept of employee engagement is a problem. A lot of you know, managers are still in that space of, I just need to worry about keeping my job. So I'm gonna do whatever I'm told and I'm gonna tell you to do because that's what's gonna keep my job. And how do I make sure that we're staying profitable? How do I make sure that we're getting the work accomplished that needs to be done? Certainly the pandemic has pointed out to us a whole host of issues that relate to employer, employee safety and health on the job. And what does that look like? And I think what we're gonna start seeing soon with hybrid and work from home issues is going to be things like, well, right now, I've got my computer sitting up on a box so that my hands are like this typing so that I can be looking directly into the camera. That's not good for carpal tunnels, right? So what is gonna be happening with our work environments and who's going to be responsible for those kinds of repetitive action injuries that occur when I'm working from home. Another aspect of the, the flexible work environment, who's paying for all the technology and who's guaranteeing the safety of the data that's being transferred when you're working from home? questions that are going to all end up in the courts and will get adjudicated probably sooner than later, but questions that are going to need to be answered before we settle things down any. Now, what are you doing to take care of those things and to be aware of those issues in your own environment? For example, um, have you negotiated with your employer that as a part of starting your new position, they will provide your internet service and all of your hard technology needs for the job. Do you want your employer using your own personal cell phone as the primary form of communication with you, or do you need them to provide you with a cell phone? As an employer, can I afford that technology at those many locations for all of those employees? Or do I need to look at a different way of engaging with my employees? Is that a reason for having to bring them back into the office, Jillian? Right? There's a whole bunch of issues that need to be considered, and we've not yet been looking at them. Anything else on this list stand out to anyone as a concern or a question? Go ahead, Laura. Hi, yes. One of the things that I think stood out to me is the last one. It's not personal, it's business. And I feel like the last two years have really emphasized how the line between business and personal is blurred, right? We have to balance things. We had to balance children at home during work hours, work in the evenings to make up for hours that we couldn't work during the day. And, and that line has really changed. And so while, yes, the bottom line needs to be met, we need to meet certain goals, we need to be profitable as a business. And I think you had it on the previous slide, like the required mental health days. Mm -hmm. It almost seems like some businesses are pulling back, which seems counterintuitive, pulling back on benefits they are providing. You're absolutely right. Um... The, and that's number nine is the impact of the ACA on benefits programs, right? The, um, the Obamacare. You know, as we move more and more towards gig, gig work, as we move more and more towards project work, more and more companies are going to shy away from offering benefits. One of the things that I saw um, relatively quickly after the ACA was approved was that employers were looking to hire people on more of a part-time basis so that they could avoid having to pay the healthcare 
for that employee. Right? And so if you work less than 30 hours a week, as a general rule, I don't have to offer you health care benefits. So I think that sometimes very soon we're going to start seeing something more like a socialized medicine model for our health benefits. But the, that then made employers look at all of their benefits. And one of the things I'm finding is that my clients are telling me if their company has gone to a PTO, a personal time off format versus vacation time, sick time, holiday time, personal time, if they're lumping it all together as just personal time off, take it, use it how you wish, they're also giving you fewer days than when they were all broken down individually. And yet there are other employers that, like the previous slide indicated, that are starting to consider, do we need to add in mental health days as a different type of time off? It's really, really fascinating to see the divergence in the way different companies are looking at this. Uh, Jared, that's how Amazon has jumped into the medication game by offering at-home delivery of medications. Yep, absolutely. And how is that changing the pharmacy industry as a disruptor. Right. Good comments. Anything else, anyone? Okay, whoops, too many. So let's start looking then at the remainder of our time together. What are some ways that we can fortify ourselves against the negative issues? or the, the problems that we will arise, that will arise from all these changes and how can we look to find these changes before they become issues to us, right? And so one of the things that I would strongly recommend for everyone, really up your observation game skills. We need to be looking at who are the people in our organization that are succeeding? Who are the ones that are challenged? Who are the people that are bringing value and not looking at it, though, from my perspective as an employee? Look at it from the perspective of your manager, your boss's boss, and the C-suite folks. Who do they see as the ones that are succeeding, who are challenged, who are bringing value? And now what do I have to do as an employee to be more like the ones that are succeeding and to be less like the ones that are challenged? Because the more I can emulate them, the more likely I'm to be successful. How can I be more flexible? And what does that mean to my boss as well as to me? I always find that if you don't like what's going on, ask a question. It's far easier to get what you want when you ask questions about it rather than when you make demands. And I'll use an example of a, a salary negotiation process or a compensation negotiation. You know, I've had three clients in the last two months say to me, the offer is too low. I want more money. I'm gonna go and tell them if they want me, they need to up the ante by $20,000. I said, oh, hold on just a second. Let's take a step back for a minute. Rather than forcing them to say no by asking, by demanding that $20,000, what are some things that we can ask for as options? For example, in one case, their spouse got their health benefits. So why don't you ask your employer, if I don't have to take the employee offered health or employer offered health benefits from you, and you're saving that cost, could that be included in my salary instead? Or you're requiring that I go to the office five days a week. For me to do that, it's gonna cost $5,000 a year. Can we have some kind of transportation allowance, right? And so I'm justifying why I want more money and looking for ways that they can provide it that maybe are not direct salary, but in the end is more money in my pocket. Right, so how can I use questions to show that I'm, I'm 
more flexible in that I want to find a solution that works for everybody. And by the way, if you have thoughts or comments on any of these, stop me, please. Oh, come on. Go ahead, Glenn. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, super conversation. Really appreciate it. I, I just want to bring uh, the management perspective in on on some on this topic particularly. I've been a vice president, a manager, director, COO of technical organizations for about 20 years now. And one of the things that really stands out to me is what you just pointed out here is that uh, employees and a lot of times their managers really don't know what success looks like. Uh, we have a job description yeah. says, okay, this is what you're going to do, you know, how you're going to pull the lever and what you're going to do, but what does success really look like? And what, how that manifests itself is during performance reviews, you know, people have really wildly different views on <clears throat> how they're performing, but I, I think a lot of it stems from not w defining very well what success looks like. And that's an easy conversation to have with your manager before a performance review, not so much during the performance review, but when starting a job or just any time in before that review, what what's success here? What what do you think this looks like? And and then once you have that defined, you can uh, modify your behaviors or your focus or your work effort, whatever, to to deliver results there. And you can also interact with your manager to say, hey, this is what I need to deliver what you've defined as success. So I think that's a really uh, important point. You know, Glenn, thank you for, for sharing that because you you are absolutely an, an enlightened manager because there aren't a lot of them that are looking at things from that perspective and talking about it in that way. But you're uh, from my perspective, you're right on target. So uh, great comments. I appreciate it very, very much. Thank you. Jillian, go ahead. I was muted. Yep. <laughs> I was going to comment on the last one that you were just talking about, Paul, about ask questions, don't make demands. Um, specifically, the health insurance um, point you brought up. Uh, my husband has worked for a company that um, will, if you don't select the insurance for the following year, every paycheck, he got a little bit extra. And it was a company-wide, but he didn't have to ask for it. It was automatically done via the company. That was one really great benefit there. And I don't know why that's not more widely utilized by organization, because when you have a significant other, you're usually going on to one insurance. Now, I, I do know some people where they keep it separate because it's actually cheaper that way. Right. Um, but for the most part, it seems like most people combine because um, one organization is always going to be less expensive than the other organization. And that company my husband worked for previously, um, they did it at, the, uh, I believe it was half the cost of their premium. Mm -hmm. So they saved 50% and my husband got 50%. And it was like a really good mix, I thought. So I don't know Perfect. why that's not more widely done, but that was yep. one really good thing about that company. Great. Thank you for sharing that. And, and you did every company approaches things differently, which I, I know I'm sounding like a different uh, a broken record with that, but it, unfortunately it's the truth. And those, those differences are only going to get more divergent and, and more diverse over time rather than people coming together and coalescing. So we need to become really great negotiators. And, and it plays into Glenn's comment as well, as well about, making sure that we do know what success looks like for our boss. Because what I think is right and what my boss thinks is right may be different things. And in the end, it doesn't matter what I think. It matters what the boss thinks. And I need to make sure that I'm doing what the boss wants. I, I got to share a, a quick story about being accessible and being available. My husband works for UPS IT here in North Jersey. And he was asked as a business analyst to provide some information to uh, an employee in another uh, strategic area within IT. So he got that request around 10 a.m. Within five or 10 minutes, he responded back to that request saying, I need more information so I make sure I give you exactly what you're looking for. Can you answer these three questions? 
15 minutes goes by, no response. An hour goes by, no response. He pings them again on their IM system, still no response. Two hours goes by, he sends an email, no response. Another hour goes by, he makes a phone call, no response. Finally, about three o'clock in the afternoon, he emails this person and this person's boss. And within 30 seconds of that hit send, he got a response back from the person. Now, is that employee being accessible? Is that employee being available? I don't think so. And you got to know that that guy's boss knew what was going on because in the email that my husband sent, he said, listen, you asked for this at 10 o'clock. I emailed you in five minutes. I emailed you again. I phone called. I emailed. I I am all these attempts over the course of this day and you've not responded. So do you need this information or not? Because I got to move on. Then he gets a response. Now, obviously, it wasn't quite as aggressive the way he wrote it in the email, right? But that was the point that he was getting across. Clearly, the manager saw that. What did that do for that individual's reputation with, it, with his manager? Do we want to be that person or do we want to be the one that's responding? Do you want to be the one that's responding in your pajamas or sitting out on the deck in the summer, sunning yourself while you're working? We get a lot of freedom with work from home, but that doesn't say that we don't have to be professional in the way we approach our, our jobs and our work. So keep that in mind as you're looking at this. I've heard a lot of people, a lot of people say working from home, they feel like they've lost connection with their coworkers, that they feel like they're working in a void. So how can we change that? How can we stop it? And one of the things that, that I've seen several people have great success with is they schedule, uh, they have a scheduled standing meeting with their manager every week. Pick a day, pick a time, but this is the time that I'm going to have 15 minutes of my time and your time devoted to each other so we can make sure we're both on the same page with whatever I'm doing. Now, you may not be able to do that all the time with everybody, but you can certainly do it with a lot of people, right? Um, make sure that you are communicating both up and down and horizontally within your organization. Make sure that the, you know, those water cooler conversations you used to have with people, you still reach out to those folks and have those kinds of conversations. Um, looking at the, the couple of the items on this list here, right? Reach out to five internal people every Monday. Um, again, you know, I, I think my husband's on the call um, and, and I love him dearly and he does some great stuff twice been successful at UPS. One of the things he did early on in the pandemic was he made a list of 50 people that he knew at his office that weren't direct reports or subordinates in any way, nowhere in his chain, but they were people that he had touched at different times during his career. And because they saw each other in the office, he would have conversations with them. So he took that list of 50 people. And every Monday, he reaches out to five names on that list. Could be a quick IM, it might be an email, but basically the message is, hey, it's been a while since we've spoken. I'd love to chat and tell you what's going on in my world, what's happening in yours. By the end of the week, three of those five people have absolutely made contact with him and they've renewed their conversations. The other two have maybe said, bad week, I'll talk to you next week or something like that. But for the most part, he's maintained contact with all of those people. And every week, he just chooses another five names and another five names, and he keeps going down the list until he's talked to everybody every 10 weeks. And that's maintained those connections that he needs so that when there is a business question that he knows John can answer, John's ready to talk to him because they've maintained their relationship. 
I would recommend you do that not just with internal people, but do that with your external network as well. Reach out to four or five or six people every year and ask them for information, right? Um, take time out of every meeting to just have some networking conversations, or as I used to say, BS, right? Talk about anything and everything but work so that you get to know each other better and you maintain that knowledge of each other and always be the one that's being motivational. Any thoughts or comments on any of the, these bullets here? Lead by example is another great strategy. I always love asking for feedback and I love to celebrate people's successes. And people feel good about those things. They, they want to tell you what they like and don't like about what you're saying and doing. And they really appreciate when you share the, the congratulations with them. So keep, do that on a regular and consistent basis with people. The be seen in the workplace goes back to that story I told already. And then this last one, and I'm going to have two slides on this or three slides on this as well, is be a consulting employee. So before I move on to consulting employees, is there anything that we've talked about thus far in terms of strategies that you have questions about or have comments on? I have a comment. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Paul. Hey, my name is Paul Trent, and I work for UPS, and I was just uh, interested in your last uh, example you were talking about. And um, I'm a you know, 22-year employee at UPS, and um, just started got uh, reassigned a new position where I'm 100% in teleworking. And I was just making the point about you know being professional. Um, you know, by dress, you never know when your boss is going to want to have a call. And um, like I said, being seen, I think is important. Um, you know, to be, you know, when somebody does text you, you know, UPS is a 24 hour business and you never know when your boss is going to come in or when somebody's having, so you have to be establish a routine when you're checking messages and when you're actually getting work done. Um, I think that's very, very important to be organized and, and, and think your role is not a nine to five job, but um, a mission job. And also work with your good, good points and work with your management, right, to identify if we need me to be available outside of the nine to five, let's talk about when are the appropriate times for me to make sure that I'm checking my messages and responding to them. What's going to work with my life and what's going to work for the business? And can we find that common ground together, right? Problem solve rather than leave it to chance and let it happen organically. Make it happen in a way that's pro programmatic so that everybody's on board and agrees with the way you're going to approach it. It's and Paul, I like, I like to follow up, Paul. I just, um, my other colleague that I'm, I'm managing, actually, I'm, I'm, I live in Maryland, but I'm managing Florida. You know, that's kind of like a, an interesting point, but my partner's in Kentucky and we basically say, okay, we're taking a break right now and we'll, we'll get back in 30 minutes. But my mental health, you know, I'm a disabled army veteran, you know, with a mental health disability that disqualified me. I was left as a major in the army. Mm -hmm. um, but my mental health has gotten so much better from all the stress as you can imagine being a, a truck dispatcher that, um, I'm able to go off and I can manage my nonprofit work and my leaders. I'm, I'm a president of a nonprofit yep. in Maryland and I'm doing other things. You know, I'm a, you know, 61 years old and I can do things and plan. I say I'm actually was planning on retirement when I found this new assignment was given to me, but now I can plan on doing other things and networking and the peace of mind that I have is makes me feel better because I'm no longer missing out on things that really enrich my life and allow me to have a greater impact on others around me. Beautiful. Beautiful. And, and it's wonderful when things work out that way. So congratulations for you, Paul, but you, you approached it the right way. You did a lot of the right things and that's what got you where you are. And that's why I'm suggesting to the rest of us that we need to think about these things and look at it, how we approach these things so that we can get the options that we want out of it. You know, um, as we move more and more to a project-based economy, to a gig economy, 
we all need to look at ourselves as a consultant. And even if we're in a long-term W-2 type of employment or a unionized employment where it's very difficult for us to lose our jobs, I still suggest that you want to look at your role from a consulting perspective. And this is how most consultants will approach their work. They're always looking to identify what is the next big challenge that's coming up and how can I show the employer I'm the problem solver for that challenge? Because as long as I'm pro solving problems and I'm seen a part of the solution, I'm valuable. Once I stop being a part of the solution, I'm no longer needed and I will be gone. Don't be a part of the gone, right? Um, be proactive in getting new skills. Be proactive in organizations, especially industry and professional associations, because that's where you're going to keep up to date on what's going on in your industry, in your profession, so that you can then bring that value back to the employer. And by the way, start negotiating that into your agreement for employment that I'm going to be allowed to attend and you're going to pay employer for me to attend ABC conferences or XYZ professional development courses. Make that a consistent part of what your future is going to be so that you are ready to be the problem solver for them. Look to reinvent. I said earlier, a career lasts 10 years. That means at 59, almost 60, I've got another career ahead of me before I retire. I need to be ready to reinvent myself into that new career, whatever it may be. I also probably need to start thinking about looking at what will that career be. And if we're a Gen uh, Z or now that I think they went back to Gen A for the kids who are coming out of high school this year, they need to be thinking about What's my career for the now and what's my next career and what's my next career and the five or six that they're going to have. Always look at ways to improve your communication skills. I especially want to say, look at your listening skills. Are you listening to respond or are you listening to understand? And if we want at some point, I can do a whole presentation just on three different types of listening. And if we actively work on our listening skills, we'll be a better employee. I'm the worst at keeping my emotions under control. I'm a hot blooded Italian. And you know, you can see exactly what I'm feeling and thinking every minute of the day. Not a good thing in work. We need to be much less emotional when we're at work. And remember, like I said before, it's business, it's not personal. If we can always be finding the positive things, always be developing our sales skills and become an expert in work search. If you're not an expert in finding your next job, you are going to be left behind. And when do you start your next job search? The day you start your current job. The more we can control our future, the more we can manage our career. And these are the things we need to do to make that happen. Any questions or comments at this point? If ever the truth was the only constant has changed, today is the day that that is the most true statement ever. I love Bob Kennedy's quote here. Those that look at things the way they are and ask why, I dream of the things that never were and ask why not. And when you think about Microsoft, Amazon, um, Virgin, you see those are the people that are asking the why not rather than the why. And Buckminster Fuller, great quote from him. So I want to just leave you with um, some upcoming presentations that I'll be doing. This one tonight is actually in person. Holy crap, it's the first time in two years I'll be doing an in-person presentation. Uh, but if you're interested in participating in any of those, you know, feel free to reach out to me and I'd be happy to get you connected to do that. Um, I do run a couple of job seeker support groups. The 
three of these are designed to be peer support groups where everybody gets a chance to share what's happening in their job search and then the group brainstorms to resolve that issue. The Yojo Club is specifically for those who are new to their career under 30 years old. Outstanding Careers Group is for the LGBTQ community and um, the Morris County Executives in Transition, even though it says Morris County, which really is New Jersey based, we're on Zoom, anybody can participate in that one. The Professional Support Group of Morris County is also on Zoom, and that's more of a speakers-based group, and so it would be more of an interaction like today in, in that group. But if you're interested in participating in any of those, please reach out to me and let me know. Um, Jillian and I were talking before we started today about the possibility of starting a, a strategic peer support group for Florida Tech alumni through the Alumni Association. And so if that's something you would be interested in, uh, please let her or me know, and we can work harder on getting that started sooner. And there's my contact information. I've put it in the chat once. I'll put it in the chat again. And I really appreciate taking your taking the time to talk to me and, and visit with me today. Um, thank you very, very much. Uh, and I always end with two questions, and I'd love to get two or three responses. The first is, what did you like about today's presentation, or what are you taking from today's presentation? Anybody want to comment real quick on that? Go ahead, Jared. Um, I'm always coming from this standpoint because I'm, I'm, I consider myself like a new job seeker because I've been in a cult for about over 20 years. So uh, the fact of is, you're all is we say the same thing in the military. You know, you're always preparing for the next. Uh, you're always preparing for the next uh, rank. So it's interesting to see that it's also like that in the civilian sector that you should be always improving and going and looking for the next job. So that's what I took away from from the uh, Zoom today. Great, thank you. And Larry put in the chat, be flexible, um, stay visible and positive. Thank you. Somebody else said something and I missed it, sorry. Um, but great. The second question I always like to ask, and I truly do mean this, go ahead and type it in the chat because we're running out of time. Um, would you like to have seen me do anything different or better in this presentation? And I truly ask that because without that feedback, I can't improve on what I do. So again, thank you. Um, and Jillian, I don't know how long you want to stay on. I am available for another 15 minutes to half an hour if people want um, so that we can uh, continue to, to have the conversation if you're interested. So I just wanted to chime in here. And once again, thank you, Paul, um, for giving your time today to, to do this program for our alumni. Um, I know they really appreciated it just from the interaction that we've um, had. This has been the most interactive program um, that we've had so far. So thank you so much. Um, I also wanted to shout out that Paul um, is our 2022 outstanding alumnus from the College of Psychology and Liberal Arts. Um, so <laughs> congratulations, Paul. We'll be honoring him at an event on campus very soon here. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to point out um, Donna Gaynor, the head of our career services at Florida Tech is on with us and she put into the chat, um, their services are always open for alumni. So if you wanna reach out to her, please feel free to do that. Um, and I also recorded today's program. So um, by uh, tomorrow mid morning, I'll send everyone a recording if you wanna review anything. I'll also um, have Paul's um, email address on there if you wanna reach out to him. And um, we really just hope that this has been a great resource for you guys. And as Paul mentioned, we were discussing about having um, some more programming in the future um, so that we can be supporting you as you're shifting and changing and growing in your own careers. And Jillian, I, I see for sure he's there. So I got to give a quick shout out and, and hugs to my husband, Dan Nazaro, who's a, a 95 graduate as well. So I'm glad you ah. were able to make the call, Janet, Dan. Thanks. I love that. We love Panther couples who bring people together. <laughs> Hi, Dan. Thank you for joining us today. All right, everybody. Well, I hope you have a fabulous afternoon and um, I will send you all that email um, by tomorrow morning. Thanks so much.